I, I, I won't go into the whole uh, acronym, but uh, some people mentioned to me the concept of RTFM when it comes to using <laughs> Zoom correctly. Uh, right. and, and those of you who don't know what that means can, uh, can Google it, find it on Urban Dictionary or whatever. Uh, but it really it's, is it's, true. It's read the manual with, with maybe an <laughs> yeah, expletive yeah, thrown there in go. there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters Podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. Today, we have two guests joining us, John Grant and Simon Bomi, who are here to talk about why Zoom is safe for lawyers if you use it correctly. John is an agile coach who runs the Agile Attorney Network, helping legal professionals and their teams and Simon is a technology entrepreneur specializing in dispute resolution. He's currently the head of operations and chief of staff, trust and safety at Lime. John and Simon, I'm really happy that you joined me today. Thanks for spending the time with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So John and Simon, I'd, I'd like to start off just giving our audience some background. You've both been exploring the safety and security of Zoom's video conferencing platform from a legal perspective. You've been talking about this on Twitter and you've written uh, several blog posts on the concept. What was the, the catalyst for you to, to start digging into this topic? So I think I started it, uh, if I remember correctly, and it, it, uh, it stemmed from what I started to see as some seemingly knee-jerk reactions around legal Twitter about the safety and security of Zoom. And uh, it pretty quickly looked to me uh, like a situation where, yes, there were some problems and, and there are some well-documented problems, but most of them can be chalked up to user error. Now, not all, um, but especially the big ones and, and the Zoom bombing was the one that was really catching the most media attention at the time. Right. And, and I knew Zoom bombing was something that was totally preventable if you just sort of got your settings right. And so I, um, for me at least, it, it became sort of another in the long line of lawyers having knee-jerk reactions to scary tech stories. Uh, and I wanted to try to sort of put some context and debunk that a little bit. And I knew that Simon, uh, through his mediation practice and coaching, had become something of an expert in Zoom. So I, uh, I reached out to Simon, Simon I think uh, maybe at first via email, but we pretty quickly had a phone call. And uh, sort of unbeknownst to him, I was keeping track and keeping notes and, and <laughs> transcribed that phone call uh, into a blog post. And I'll let Simon take it from there. Right. Well, I, I've been in online dispute resolution for nearly a decade, and I've been a very early user of Zoom. Same with John. And uh, with John, we've been, uh, you know, uh, technologists, advocates in, in the legal field, uh, wanting to push people online and be responsible users. And um, given the unfortunate uh, circumstances of COVID-19, um, um, uh, you know, through economic hardship and, and, and just a really uh, serious illness, um, a lot of uh, mediators and arbitrators that I've been training have been forced to put their practice online. And I've, you know, trained over a thousand people in, in, in the past few months. And the number one question has always been security. And John wrote that excellent blog post we had. It must have been a two hour conversation where we were just talking about the intricacies of, you know, there is a, a real serious responsibility of the lawyer to protect his or her client and for the mediator to make sure that they, they know that they're not interrupting a privileged conversation, right? And, and, and so um, in general, I, I almost felt like when I was training people on how to use Zoom, it was mostly about uh, kind of being this cheerleader for Zoom because many people were like, oh no, I can't use it because it's not safe. But I'm agnostic to the platform. It's just how can we encourage people to, to stay on um, and, 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 and start to trust Zoom? Let's talk for a moment about where maybe some of the issues and the concerns about Zoom first started arising. So John, you mentioned Zoom bombing. Um, very briefly, what is Zoom bombing and what other security concerns did we see arise that, that started this, this meme around Zoom not being suitable for lawyers and legal work? 
Yeah, so Zoom bombing uh, is or was, I think still is to some extent, a phenomenon uh, where if people hosted a Zoom room without uh, either applying a password or otherwise sort of taking a couple of fairly simple but uh, apparently easy to overlook, at least for some people, security measures, then anyone who had access to the uh, nine or 10 digit code that indicated a particular Zoom room could drop in, uh, at which point it became something like chat roulette, if, uh, if you're old enough to remember that stuff. Like right. That. Uh, Essentially brute forcing the meeting ID just out, out of the whatever million key space that exists for a, a nine digit password. Yeah. Brute forcing although, that until you, you get in. Although most of them weren't even that, right? So most of the, the instances of Zoom bombing came from publicly posted rooms, right? So there was one, I think at UCLA or USC, you know, it was a professor in a large seminar that had posted out the, the Zoom room for a 300 person class. And so of course, that's an easy to come by number, right? You didn't have to brute force it at all. Um, later on, there were people that were writing bots on Twitter that anytime someone posted a Zoom happy hour on right. Twitter that was unsecured, uh, then uh, a bunch of nefarious actors would show up. And I, I personally was in a room that was uh, Zoom bombed. Uh, I, I won't drop right. names, but people you and I know well, uh, <laughs> accidentally or on purpose, but, but uh, neglectfully posted the Zoom room on Twitter. And it took less than 30 seconds uh, for people to start Interesting. showing up with swastika face masks and other things. So, so a good lesson, if you post a private link to a public forum, it is now a public link and expect expect that link to be followed by, uh, by people that might have nefarious purposes. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so another, uh, and, and, and just as John uh, described it, after Zoom bombing, a, a lot of other stuff came out as well. Data centers being routed through China so you'll notice um, in Zoom, one of their latest updates is you can select certain data centers. Um, China, at least for US users, is automatically unselected, but you can also choose to only have your data routed through the US, Canada, um, Europe, um, other things as well. Then it was also, there was rumors that the DOJ was present, uh, preventing their lawyers from using it, New York Public Schools prevented um, using Zoom. Again, as John was saying, kind of these knee-jerk reactions um, started to cascade and have a negative fallout for Zoom. Right, and then, so I, on a few fronts we saw, I, I think as you mentioned initially, John, the, the Twitter sphere, the legal Twitter sphere kind of lit up with a bunch of um, maybe legitimate concerns about Zoom security, but also plenty of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or, or FUD, as we sometimes call it around new technologies, and I think you can, sometimes see those two things really getting uh, conflated. There's, there's legitimate concerns and then there's, there's some that are just the anxiety that we all have sometimes around new technologies that was being directed at, at Zoom. But I, I think there's a few, a few important points about this discussion. Number one, it appears there's some legitimate concern around uh, some of the default settings that Zoom had out of the box, so to speak. And I, I think, you know, as a, a software entrepreneur for over a decade now, one thing I've come to understand really, really well is the power of defaults. If you have a default setting in your software, odds are very strong that your customers, your users will never change those defaults. So as a, as a customer being aware of the default settings in your software and places where modifying those default settings might make sense, I think is, uh, is super important. Um, and it sounds like Zoom also acknowledged there's a few places it was weaker on security than it should be, especially, uh, Simon, as you point out, on the, the data residency piece around where is your data being transmitted? Uh, is it truly end-to-end -end encrypted? Who has access to your data? Uh, and we saw Zoom, I think, really listen to the feedback it was getting. And around a month ago, the CEO, Eric Wan, announced that he was going to spend, dedicate the next quarter of their software development roadmap to 100% security fixes and, uh, and, and, and privacy related enhancements to, uh, to Zoom. So to put that to question form, I, I'm curious, and maybe we'll start with you, Simon, when you, when you look at the, the changes that you've seen Zoom roll out over the last 
uh, last month especially, there's been many enhancements you touched on one. What has that gained us from a security and privacy perspective and what default settings should we be aware of that maybe still need tweaked? And, and John, feel free to jump in when you've got a, a perspective on that as well. One thing that I love about being a technology entrepreneur and, and Jack and John, you know this, is when you build a product that people love, the greatest source and, and how you build that product is through feedback. And Zoom has taken that so seriously these past, through, uh, past few months. It's incredible. The security features um, is outstanding. And I think it just starts with the magic toolbar, as I call it, at the very bottom. The host now has a shield for security that can remove participants, that can lock the meeting. Um, you can um, also adjust the settings of the waiting room. So I think, especially for lawyers, I think it's so critical for lawyers to understand that Zoom is a platform intended for everyone. There are hundreds of millions of users. This technology wasn't necessarily designed for lawyers, but there are a lot of default settings, as you point out, Jack, that will make it very secure to keep your clients safe. And it starts with by setting a password. It can be easy as your name. It can be the last four digits of your phone number. Um, just have a password and make sure you also send in the message uh, to your clients. You know, do not forward this. Do not post this on social media. The second is the waiting room. The waiting room is an awesome feature. For example, during this podcast, if you know Jack was always using this room for all of his podcasts, and you know Aaron Levine wanted to come in and just say hi to you know John and Simon and Jack, and you know the cute baby would also come in, you know. <laughs> Jack would probably have to say, sorry, Aaron, you know, this is just for us, even though we'd probably want Aaron to come. Aaron, I'd probably let in if I'm being yeah. honest. But, <laughs> we all love Aaron. But at least I have that choice. Uh, and, and that's the power of the waiting room. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and, and there are some other features as well. It's the data centers, the defaults that it removes China um, uh, and, and that data region as well. And, and just to talk for a second about the technical aspects of that. When, when we're talking about the, where the data is being routed and, and whether it's passing through China or not, can you just explain a little bit what, what, that, what that means and, and what the implications from a privacy perspective might be? Sure, so uh, I'm a, a big watcher of the legal you know, beehive that is Twitter and, and all these rumors that kind of start as well. And it, it kind of just started um, uh, especially that there were these data centers in China. So for example, this Zoom call could go through a server in China and uh, you know, the, the Chinese uh, were listening in on this conversation or if you were having highly sensitive mediations or um, discussions that someone else was listening in. And so uh, now essentially, at least for US users, um, the data that, um, you, that uh, is created that you send to, to you know, John, to Jack, um, it essentially goes through data servers that are here uh, in the United States or other regions you may have selected. Great. And John, tell me what you have to, to add to, to Simon's perspective there. Well, you know, it, it's the beauty, and, and as Simon pointed out at the beginning, right, there, there is something about... Uh, a, a technology company and and the technology ecosystem and the continual evolution of it, right? Zoom is not, you know, far from the first player in the space, right? Skype kind of broke it open, uh, you know, over well over a decade ago. Um, and there's been GoToMeeting and WebEx and lots of other Google Hangouts, uh, Google Hangouts, right? Which which um, Facebook Portal trying to get in the game, right? There, there are lots of ways to do it, but. For some reason, and, and that reason is, is you know, a combination of smart engineers and good design, uh, Zoom has uh, gotten themselves to the forefront of the national conversation. And I, I was looking at some data earlier today. I think you know, they, their peak user uh, prior to the COVID epidemic was, uh, epidemic was in uh, Christmas time 2019, where they were averaging 10 million users a day. Um, as of early April, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were averaging 200 million daily users, and they're now wow. up over 300 million daily users. Wow. And this is a company that has scaled to that level of load practically seamlessly, right? So that's, been, that's a 30-fold increase in volume in 
you know, is in a six month period. Exactly. And, and the reason, you know, to, to my eye that they have been so successful is that they have created a superior user experience, right? And, and customer experience. They have made it really easy, easier than Skype, easier than Google, easier than Facebook to create and host a video meeting amongst a group of people. Um, you know, and then to Simon's point, even as they were building before they had this giant user load, they had some real innovations in the space. The idea of the waiting room, the idea of the breakout rooms. You know, as Simon said, we've been using it in mediation for years now, and it's because of that breakout room functionality that that's even possible. Uh, and, and the other tools just aren't up to that. And and you know, they're playing catch up now. And and you know, obviously Google is uh, pushing Hangouts hard through the Gmail interface these days, but um, I think it's because so many people have been typing zoom.com URLs into the right. location space. Well, and, and just a funny story about the breakout rooms that speaks to the influence lawyers, legal professionals, mediators have in technology is uh, one of my mentors, and I call him the father of online dispute resolution, Colin Rule. He was an early entrepreneur in Modria as well, and he was right across the hallway from the, you know, Eric and the guys at Zoom when Zoom was uh, maybe, you know, a thousand daily users. Um, and, and he just said, hey, there's a real need for uh, lawyers, for mediators to use breakout rooms. And you can expand uh, your user base if you just add this simple functionality. And they've kept it, you know, it would have been easy for Zoom to get rid of it. But that's why I love, um, you know, it, lawyers who give feedback and why I'm such a big fan of these alternatives like Modron or Legaler or Resolve Disputes Online where you can talk to founders and you can give them their feedback. And that's the real power that lawyers have um, and, and can build in these features um, into the, you know, who knows what the next Zoom will be. I, I think that's a, a hugely important point. And as a, a legal tech entrepreneur, I, I often get asked the question, where, where do we get the vision for what we created with Clio is that what I thought it would be when we started out in 2008? And the answer is uh, emphatic no, because I, I really had no idea what we were going to build beyond that 0 0.1 version that we shipped at ABA Tech Show back in 2008. And the rest has been built listening to our customers and listening to the customers that engage with us uh, and tell us what they want to see. And I, I think it's a hugely important point. And, and may, maybe the the distinction between a general purpose tool and a legal specific tool is one we can explore a little bit as well, because John, you, you commented on the fact that look, zoom has become the undisputed reigning champion of video chat, you know, and, and it, there's just no one even close to zoom in the popular conscience. And, and it, it feels like they have such a lead over everyone else that's trying to play catch up that there's, there's no hope for anyone that's lagging behind Zoom and, and uh, kudos to them. I, I think as you pointed out, John, they've done a better job of executing on user experience of basic things like, is the video quality good? Is the audio quality good? Is the platform stable? They've really nailed um, every, every aspect of that and they've left uh, WebEx and Skype and uh, Google Hangouts in the rear view mirror. Um, when we, when we think about the, the, the legal specific tools that exist in this space. Uh, and you mentioned a few, Simon, why would we consider a legal specific solution over uh, a more general horizontal solution? And, and how, do, how should a lawyer kind of evaluate the, the trade-offs that might exist, maybe especially on the client side, if there's already some amount of facility with a tool like Zoom and then asking them to, to learn something new because it's perhaps better tailored for a legal use case. So, so I, let, let, me, let me take this quickly right. first, because I, I have something that I, I kind of originally developed a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's actually held reasonably true, which is, uh, and I call it John's first rule of legal technology, <laughs> which is that if you are doing something with technology that is something that everybody else in the world does, then you should start with the tools that everybody else in the world uses. Um, and, and I think that's true for, for a number of reasons. Um, if nothing else, right, because of Zoom's success, 
they are able to now further invest in the product and the delivery. And so because they use an agile development cycle, right, which is the, the whole thing that I'm advocating lawyers to, to adopt, um, but that agile cycle takes user feedback into account uh, and is able to incorporate that feedback really quickly. And the, the more investment, the more user load you have, the more feedback you're getting, the more quickly a product can evolve. And, and we've certainly seen that with Clio and Clio Grow and, and, and all the rest. Um, and that, that virtuous cycle where you know, the, the, the winner in a marketplace, and I think this is especially true in software marketplaces, the, the winner just becomes this self-reinforcing virtuous cycle where yeah. they're able to invest more in making the product better. They draw more users and more revenue because the product is better. And there's this, this really, um, this, this flywheel that starts taking hold. Absolutely. Now the flip side of that is that if you're doing something that, that is really specific to legal work or, or to the needs of lawyers and the justice system, then by all means turn to the specialty products. Right. And, and, you know, that again is true of Clio, right? Clio uh, has absolutely nailed trust accounting, right? It is the greatest thing in, in terms of the organizations that I've been involved in, right? That solves for a very specific need of lawyers and it solves it perfectly. And so don't try to shoehorn trust accounting into Harvest or FreshBooks or QuickBooks invoicing because you're likely to have a headache. You have a specialist tool that can do it. And so right. I think I think tools, and, and I, I'm less familiar with the intricacies of them, Simon can maybe speak to them, but tools like Legaler, they are solving problems that lawyers have that are different from the problems that the, gener that the general public has. And so I think that's where if your individual use case falls into that category, then by all means, yes, use the specialty tools. Yeah, that's a great a great perspective. And, and yeah, with that, maybe over to you, Simon. Yeah. Great points, John. I, I, I completely agree. I, so, for example, we can use Legaler, and uh, you know, I met Stevie, uh, for example, during this COVID nineteen, and and I've come on as just kind of an informal advisor, you know, telling him and, and coaching him, hey, you know, th these are a few things you can add to the roadmap that would make it a really powerful uh, video conferencing tool for mediators and arbitrators, and it includes things like you know, having built in uh, APIs with DocuSign, with using Stripe, you know, collecting payment, recording how long you spent uh, on a call, um, you know, those kinds of things where you can make a negotiation process where you can make a client meeting end to end within Legaler or Modron, which is more mediation, um, uh, ADR driven. But uh, I think Legaler is solving for a lot of these issues and also, when we're, you know, the premise of this podcast, right, is security. It is always possible to be Zoom bomb kind of in any platform, but there's not these malicious algorithms like, you know, John was saying, where they scour Twitter or they scour the internet to find the nine digit, 10 digit meeting IDs, right? In Legaler, you're much safer. Zoom is for hundreds of millions of people. Um, and Legaler will have a lot of tools, easier breakout rooms, you know, on the product roadmap. Modron already has some of those things as well. Um, and, I, and, and hopefully courthouses will soon adopt these as well. I mean, Jack, you had such a great conversation with the Suskinds, um, Suskinds and, and, and they're incredible thought leaders in this. And now it's about taking action and it's about how we can, in, uh, perfect, there's the book, right? And, and it's how can we use this legal driven um, technology, not just plugging and playing WebEx or BlueJeans, you know, which was purchased by Verizon for 400 million. It's, it's, it's user-centric user design and thinking about the lawyer and the client. Um, and just to your one point too, Jack, is you're right, it is tough. When clients are already used to Zoom, how do you convince them to come to something else like Legaler or like a Modron? And um, what I tell lawyers, and I think there is an ethical obligation that there, you should have a backup option. You can't just rely on Zoom. Geico, I've heard, doesn't uh, allow its lawyers and for people to use Zoom. And so what do you do? I mean, do you just lose that client? You need to have backup options. So I think Legaler, again, is a really good backup option, maybe using WebEx. I'm not a big fan of these big box ones. I like lawyers using technology designed for lawyers. And that, that's maybe a good tie-in with John's comment where find technology that is tailored for lawyers, but be really aware of what pain point you're trying to solve for yourself or maybe for your clients 
in the solution you're looking for because otherwise the general purpose solution is actually probably a better fit and ultimately going to be probably more powerful and at a better price performance ratio than than what you might see from a from a legal specific solution um well so when if, we if i can pick ahead, back John. on that if, yeah if i can piggyback on that just briefly because you mentioned you know out, out of the box settings and and while i think it is a truism that most users will stick with those settings uh, i think it's equally true that uh too many users, and that includes lawyers, but not limited to lawyers, uh, will sort of accept their technology unquestioningly, right? And assume that those out of the box settings are what are looking out for them. And, and I think, you know, we are obviously taught to be skeptics and, and uh, probably have a, a predisposition to skepticism and critical thinking. But um, it really is important to truly understand what is your process. And to Simon's point about having um, some backups and some fail safes, right? If you truly understand what your process is for initiating the mediation, for handling a client intake, for um, negotiating with opposing counsel, whatever it might be that you're using technology for, if you know what your process is, uh, and it, you know, it, it, frankly, it gets to the Susskind's um, uh, contention that court is a Right. I, I often say court is a process, not a, not a building. They use court as a service, not a building. But it's, it's the same thing, right? If you understand the process that you're trying to accomplish, then you can execute that process using any number of tools. But if you become tied into the tools and you let the tools themselves de define your process, then you wind up stuck, right? And, and you can get stuck in a number of levels. And, right. And there, there is a responsibility for lawyers to have a certain level of competency. And, and just exactly to John's point is that you can't just start a Zoom meeting and then, oh, I'm going to have all the parties come in and they'll automatically be shuffled to their breakout rooms, right? It requires training. It requires understanding that just like I lock my front door, you have to lock the Zoom meeting. One of the most basic things you can do, you verbally communicate it to your clients. You also verbally verify that no one is recording. You know, um, and you remove that default function, the record function at the bottom of the Zoom, right? There are so many different things that lawyers need to know and understand. And it's the lawyer's responsibility, I believe. And it requires training and some level of competency. Yeah, I think these are super important points, especially when we're talking about mass market consumer software, where the default settings for this software is going to be optimized for ease of use, ease of access, and, and optimized for probably your, your grandfather that is not super technol technology uh, savvy. And, and lots of those settings are gonna need fine tuned for uh, a security conscious law firm use case. And it's not that these tools are not suitable for legal professionals, but they're, they need to be tailored and modified uh, from a settings perspective to, to fit that use case. So if we net this all out, I wanna wrap up the discussion about Zoom and then move on to you know, more general discussion topics. But to net this all out, is Zoom secure enough for lawyers to use? So I continue to stand by the title of the blog post that I put out you know, nearly two months ago now, which is Zoom is safe for lawyers, parentheses, if you know how to use it right. And, and I think that's right. You know, I, I, I won't go into the whole uh, acronym, but uh, some people mentioned to me the concept of RTFM when it comes to using <laughs> Zoom correctly. Uh, right. and, and those of you who don't know what that means can, uh, can Google it, find it on Urban Dictionary or whatever. Uh, but it really it's, is it's, true. It's read the manual with, with maybe an yeah, expletive yeah, thrown there in there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, right, if, if, to Simon's point, right, you have a duty to understand the, the settings and the tools and the ramifications of the things that you're using. I think there, again, I think there were some issues with Zoom uh, with respect to the data routing and with respect to a few other things that uh, could have been of concern to some lawyers in some situations. Right, a, someone someone negotiating a, an ultra secret technology transaction probably doesn't want that communication going through China, uh, right. and so that that was an issue that frankly was of concern that that reading the manual would have done you no good at the time. Um, and fortunately, you know, to to the earlier point, Zoom 
has dedicated at least this sort of 90 day period that we're in the middle of right now to security improvements. I know they just rolled out a version five, a required update for all users um, that dramatically increased uh, security in a number of ways. And so I, I think, uh, I believe it was true for most lawyers when I wrote the blog post, I think it is especially true today that if you know how to use it right, Zoom is safe. Great. Zoom is safe. And it's also important to know that everything is 100% hackable. Someone can be malicious and bring a recorder into a client intake meeting, into a critical negotiation, contract drafting. And similar to this, I could be recording um, maliciously with a third party recorder on my desktop, right? And, and, and everything is hackable in some sort of way. And, and so I think it's just important. I just find it especially funny when, when uh, some lawyers and, and maybe they're uh, twice my age, much older, and they say, I'm not going to use Zoom. You know, I'm just going to stick with email and, and the phone and stuff. But email is just so, it's not safe. It's not, well, it's terrible. Right. And, um, it's just, I think, you know, it, uh, you don't even need to have a, a, a debate on a podcast about whether email is safe. We just know email is, <laughs> is unencrypted and we know it's really not safe. And yet to yes. many lawyers, it feels like the safe fallback compared to a, a Zoom meeting, which as, as you're pointing out is truly bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, uh, it, what I really hope one day is that the level of tech competency is not just about using certain products, but it's taking a step back and understanding how technology works, how the internet works. And I think that frame of mind would equip lawyers and give them such a, a fundamental knowledge that would help them, as John say, design the right process to really think about this strategically, to understand which products I'm going to use more. And maybe it's using email less. Obviously, email is so important. But again, everything's hackable. Zoom is safe. And I hope people continue to use it much past the pandemic. I, I think, Simon, you, you touched on a point that really brought to front of mind what I've seen so many times in my 12 years in, in legal. And, and when Clio came out, it, it was the first cloud-based practice management system. So dealing with, you know, helping lawyers navigate uh, a new platform, a new type of technology, a new kind of distribution model for technology, and dealing with all the, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the, the FUD issues that in some cases, uh, our on-premise competitors were kind of seeding into the market, for example. This is not new to me. And I certainly saw um, echoes of that experience in the, the, the Zoom backlash that we, we saw about a month ago. And, and what occurred to me in that discussion all over again is that I think the default mode for lawyers thinking is in a binary black and white, white kind of way. Something is secure or it's not. And I think what's so important, and you pointed this out, everything is hackable. Uh, any mode of communication can be hacked uh, and compromised with enough investment and enough dedication of resources and time. And we, we need, I, I think, as a profession to start thinking in the nuance that exists in the real world and understanding that this is about risk management. This is about minimizing risk, and it's about looking at being technologically competent enough to actually assess those risks. And I, I think it's one of the reasons I'm very heartened by the fact that so many state bar associations are starting to require technical competency as, as one of the elements of being competent. We've seen that in the, the model rules from the, from the ABA. Uh, we're starting to see CLE become mandatory around technical competence. So there's some great uh, structural change happening on that front. But the, at the end of the day, looking at Zoom or, or any other technology as uh, a risk and reward trade-off and thinking about that as a, as a spectrum, I think is, is so important. And what I'd love to ask both of you on that, on that note is what kinds of heuristics do, do lawyers and, and maybe even regulators of lawyers use when they're thinking about technology and where do those sometimes go awry and, and, and what would your recommendations be on how to best evaluate technology using this, using this kind of risk mitigation framework as a, as a tool or, or, or maybe something else that completely different that you might think uh, would best be applied? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I think there, there are a few different things that come to mind, but one of the things as you were talking is I, I agree that I, I think it's useful 
to have a duty of competence either expressed or implied in the RPCs. But I actually think that bar associations need to go further than that, right? And, and I mm -hmm. think one of the things that we often are missing as a profession is what is the what is the quality standard that we should aspire to attaining? And so right. you know, I, I would love, and, and, and you, you already brought up email, right? I'll, I'll bring up another one is, is connecting to uh, uh, unsecured hotspots, right? And, and we've seen, you know, any of us that, that read Bob Ambrosi have seen these ransomware attacks and these other things, right? There are so many ways that, that lawyers and law firms are vulnerable to nefarious actors. And to your point, the, the degree of risk, um, there's sort of the, you know, the, the, the percent likelihood is one part of the equation. And then um, sort of the, the consequences of failure is another part of the equation. So something that might be remote in likelihood might have huge consequences like a ransomware right. attack. Right. Um, right. And, and helping, I, I think bar associations, I'd like to see bar associations do more and, and some probably are and, and you know, they'll tweet at me or email me uh, to let me know uh, that they're doing more. But I, I would like to see more that says, hey, you know, at bare minimum, don't send files over email. Uh, don't connect to unsecured hotspots. Uh, use a password generator right? Or a, a, a password program. Don't use the same password for lots of different things, right? There right. are really basic security measures that I guarantee that a large percentage of lawyers who are freaking out over Zoom were not taking in their day-to-day -day lives that have far more serious consequences and a far higher likelihood of happening than uh, someone unwanted showing up on their Zoom meeting. So, uh, you know, to, to wrap that up, I think having a sense of, okay, what is, what's my goal with, with uh, technology security? What am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to protect sensitive client information. I'm trying to prevent unwanted access. Uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, ensure the stability and uh, continuation of my own legal business uh, and, and come up with those goals. And then you know, either do the research or work with a professional, or again, hopefully maybe some bar associations will get involved to say, great, the best first step, you know, uh, Sam Glover at Lawyerist has, has had some good content around this for a while, um, right? These are the first steps you should take in terms of providing your own security uh, audit. Um, and then once you do that, here's some next steps and here's some next steps. And, you know, to Simon's point, you'll never be 100% secure, but you can sure knock off a lot of low-hanging fruit. When I'm evaluating new technology, and, and this is mostly from just my deep passion and interest in conflict resolution, is, is how does the technology create conflict? And how does the technology resolve conflict? And I think those kinds of different lessons, you know, for example, when I was looking at smart contracts a few years ago, funny how that was really all the rage when blockchain and all that stuff took <laughs> off, and now it's kind of like dead silence. Um, you know, and lawyers were like, oh man, this is really, you know, our, our contract process is going to be rewritten, and no one really brings that stuff up anymore. But to me, when you look at introducing new technology and you think about the conflict that it can uh, potentially introduce to your practice, um, to your clients, you know, it, it, just as John said, it's about finding the right kind of training and make sure you're aligned with your goals. Um, but technology is inevitable. I remember building my first computer when I was like 10 or 11. I don't even remember how young I was. And technology is here to stay. And, and, and I think when the bar associations, and I hope they get much more aggressive about pushing um, uh, lawyers into the loop on how uh, people can be uh, technically competent, um, it's going to reduce the amount of conflict and the friction, and it's overall going to, hopefully for those that decide to integrate more technology, is going to make their uh, practice a competitive edge. Um, and, and what I've been telling a lot of these mediators that I've been training and when I speak at bar associations, do not just let this be a one-time thing. Do not let COVID-19 and the skills that you have trained and learned during this time go to waste once it's over. People are going to be traveling less more than likely. Um, you know, people will still want to meet and just having these offerings online, whatever you do and whatever you feel is appropriate and safe and works for your clients, continue to keep it online because it's going to end up being a competitive advantage. I think, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, go ahead, John. I was just say one, one other thing that I would throw out there is, is to just 
you know, a, avoid or really hold actively in your head this idea that technology is not set in stone. I mean, it's, right. it's incredibly dynamic. And, you know, to, to use a random uh, real world example, uh, I was a huge fan of the app uh, Weather Underground. I used it for years. It had incredibly accurate forecasts. It had uh, really great maps, uh, radar maps and all the rest, you know, which in the Pacific Northwest, we need, we need to know when the rain's coming. Um, <laughs> we do. And uh, that platform was bought by, uh, I believe it was IBM. Uh, they redesigned and improved the app, and I'm putting that in air quotes, uh, and completely ruined it, right? It is uh, utterly useless uh, for, for the needs that I have, and I've had to switch to something else, you know, to, to figure out if I need to bring a rain jacket to my kid's soccer practice or not. Uh, and so you know, that, that sort of thing happens all the time in technology, uh, on, both on the good side and the bad side, right? So Zoom... Right. Zoom initially uh, took some knocks, uh, you know, before we jumped on the uh, hit the record button, Jack was talking about some early security foibles of, of Dropbox, which, you know, lawyers, there are some lawyers who, who will hold in their head for the rest of their lives this idea that Dropbox isn't secure. And you know, I still hear about it at CLEs all the time, all, you know, all the time. Uh, I think 10 years after that, that security issue they had. Uh, and it probably became the most secure document sharing platform the day after that uh, that happened because they 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 had a less public I'm sure version of what Eric Wan told his team at Zoom in response to some of these early bits of feedback they were getting on privacy and security and and I'm sure you know if we cut to 12 months from now uh, Zoom will probably have a very strong case to make that it is if not the most secure one of the most secure. Uh, and privacy conscious platforms out there. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. So don't don't feel like just because something uh, happened once, and you know, I, I, I'm seeing this a little bit in, in Oregon, and I've been uh, publicly a little critical of the Oregon court's response to um, the pandemic. And, and part of that, frankly, stems from the fact that during the, the hype of the Zoom bombing cycle, uh, uh, Oregon made one of those decisions that we won't use Zoom. Zoom's not safe or not secure. Uh, and as a result, uh, they're using another package that requires uh, a really heavy install. And I've had to be on some of these calls with the courts where uh, I install WebEx and, and it has literally taken over my Mac. And so I'm now in a position, it is so complicated to get it up and running. And then when I do a restart, it's got all these auto loaders and pop-ups and it's trying to like make itself my default in every meeting. It's, it's like those old, you know, when, when the, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just all this pre-installed stuff. And so now I have to actively uninstall WebEx when I'm done with one of the court calls. Every time you use it. Every time. And I will reinstall it if I have to, but it is like such a beast and it's chewing up so much of my memory and all the rest that it's, it's like, it makes me crazy. And yet that's the decision, like, because, the Oregon courts made that decision, and because courts get stuck in this res judicata, stare decisis thing, uh, even when it has nothing to do with legal issues, um, they are uh, completely unwilling to revisit that decision. Yeah, I, I think on that point, it's so important that you keep it simple. I, when I am teaching people how to use Zoom, keep it simple, stupid, is that technology, Zoom and WebEx, these are not the end all be all right? Incorporate the tool. It's another tool in your toolbox. So incorporate the tool where it's appropriate. Don't just have a Zoom meeting if it's going to make things more complicated, right? And I've never known a successful mediator who hasn't had to use their cell phone, you know, to call the other party before they go in a breakout, right? And instead of sharing a document via email, John's right, you shouldn't be sharing really important documents over email, share it via Zoom. Maybe that's easier for people to do, right? And, and or you send it via email, I don't know. But I think what's so important is tech is not this vacuum. It's not going to solve all of your problems. Use it where it's appropriate and make sure it's aligned with your goals. Make sure it's aligned with the expectations of your clients. Simon, when you're on with Jack Newton, you're supposed to talk about the Clio document portal. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Clio. <laughs> yeah, you, you, send, you send it via Clio Connect. We'll, yeah, we'll, thank we'll, you. We'll, uh, document Clio Connect. Okay. I'll, I'll forgive that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed this conversation with both of you. Thank you for, for shining, you know, an important spotlight on, I, I think not just the zoom security issues in particular, um, but more broadly on how we should think about security 
and privacy uh, as legal professionals and, and some of the ways that that thinking uh, can be maybe evolved a little bit in, in, and make us better suited for delivering better experiences to our clients, better services to our clients, all at a, um, in a more accessible way for, uh, for everyone. Uh, to conclude, I'll ask both of you, um, where can we find out more about this topic? What resources would you recommend and where can we find, where, where can we follow you online? And, and let's start with you, John. Uh, so I still, it's, it's actually been one of my most popular blog posts in years. Uh, so if you, if you uh, Google is Zoom safe for lawyers, you're likely to come up with the, uh, the Agile Attorney blog at agileattorney.com. Uh, and that's where you can find out more about me and, and the work I do with. Uh, and, and very briefly, firms. John, tell, tell us about your, your, your book. Tell us, tell us about your, your practice. Yeah. So I, um, you know, as you said at the top, right, I, I, uh, I work with lawyers and legal teams uh, to teach them the tools of modern entrepreneurship to build practices that are more profitable, scalable, and sustainable for themselves and their communities. Uh, and I really try to, although I use Agile Attorney uh, because the alliteration is nice, uh, I draw from a lot of different concepts, including lean and design thinking and jobs to be done. Uh, and, and probably a few that people haven't really heard of um, to try to get lawyers to think more in terms of the value they're delivering to clients, uh, maybe how to productize some of those services, uh, how to evolve into different pricing methods. I, I do a lot with folks that are uh, moving into flat fee or subscription-based pricing, trying to really come up with different ways, unbundled uh, legal services. I have more and more of my clients are, are moving into the unbundled space, trying to to create offerings that help close the access to justice gap, uh, as well as remain profitable for the, the legal services providers. So uh, that's a big part of what I do. Uh, I, I have a, a book called Kanban for Lawyers. It's still uh, kind of a work in progress. It's published on LeanPub, which is a lean startup uh, style uh, publishing tool. It means I'm publishing it chapter by chapter uh, as I find time to write chapters. Uh, and then I've got some uh, video content, some blogs, some webinars uh, on my website that people are welcome to check out. Awesome. Thank you. And Simon? Uh, you can find me uh, on odrzoom.com. So I uh, released my deck that I train people and use to help mediators, arbitrators, peace builders to using Zoom. Um, and uh, also you can find links on my website, Um And so... Uh, again, thanks, Jack, for having me on. This has been a real treat and always a, a pleasure to, to speak alongside uh, John Grant. So uh, just, this yeah, was a lot this of fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you both for joining us. And yeah, uh, stay healthy out there. We'll make sure that links to uh, your respective sites are in the show notes as well. Thanks again. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast.